Welcome to another literary reading from the Alaska Quarterly Review in the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center. You can find recordings of the previous star-studded programs, two full years worth now, at our website, aqreview.org and our YouTube channel. And in honor of National Poetry Month and Earth Day, we will hear from three exceptional, inspiring, and I would say essential poets, women um, whose words we need today, Ellen Bass, Alaskan Anne Carre, and Allison Hawthorne Deming. And today's program is also a little different as following the readings, um, these three will have a conversation about art, poetry, nature, the big stuff that matters. So stick around for that. We'll run a little bit longer than usual. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Heather Lendy and I'm the current uh, Alaska State Writer Laureate. And on behalf of the Center for Narrative and Lyric Arts, which is the kind of the board or the fundraising arm of Alaska Quarterly Review, uh, thank you for being here. Gunashish, as we say, uh, where I am down on the chilly, but starting to green up banks of the Chilkat River in uh, Haines or Deshu, Alaska. It's the land of the uh, Clinket, Jilkat Kwan and Jilkut Kwan. Uh, while this program is free, AQR, like all literary journals, could uh, use your help. So please consider a donation to support the publication of fine writers like we're about to hear today. And now I'd like to introduce um, Ron Spatz. Ron is the uh, co-founder, uh, editor-in-chief, Grand Poobah of Alaska Quarterly Review, a professor of English at the University of Alaska. Ron is also a former National Endowment for the Arts Fellow, the recipient of two Alaska Governor's Awards and a Contribution to Literacy Award from the Alaska Center for the Book. And under Ron's is it 42 years now of enthusiastic leadership and vision, Alaska Quarterly Review has created some strong connections between our state and the larger literary community. And uh, most importantly, been influential in supporting new and emerging writers, as well as presenting works that include a rigorous questioning of larger societal issues. Ron? Uh, thank you, Heather. And welcome everybody to our celebration of National Poetry Month and Earth Day. This event concludes our series for 2021. And like all of our events, as Heather said, it is being recorded and will be available on the Alaska Quarterly Review YouTube channel. Please feel to watch any of our prior programs and to share them widely. Alaska Quarterly Review is committed to presenting these programs without charge and to showcase vibrant and diverse new and emerging voices and literary conversations with depth, complexity, and humanity. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few important acknowledgments. Alaska Quarterly Review gratefully acknowledges the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center for hosting and providing technical support for this event and the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, Alaska Quarterly Reviews 501c3 umbrella organization, which makes this event possible. I also want to make a land acknowledgement. Alaska Quarterly Review recognizes the indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. AQR is located in Anchorage and Anchorage is Denina homeland. Denina is the language spoken by the traditional present and future caretakers of this land and land acknowledgement opens a space with gratefulness and respect for the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspective of, of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. And now to begin, Heather Lendy will be introducing today's featured poets, Ellen Bass, Alison Hawthorne Deming, and Anne Corey. Heather is the author of four books of nonfiction, all published by Algonquin, if you lived here, I'd know your name. Take good care of the garden and the dogs. Find the good. And her most recently published book of Bears and Ballads. Back to you, Heather. Thank you, Ron. And um, it's really exciting to be here. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce everybody at once and then they'll just take it away. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Alison Hawthorne Deming. Uh, her most recent books include Zoologies on Animals and the Human Spirit and the poetry collection Stairway to Heaven. 
recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, Stegner Fellowship at Stanford, National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships, and a Walt Whitman Award. She's a Regents Professor Emerita at the University of Arizona and lives in Tucson and in New Brunswick in Canada. Her new nonfiction book, A Woven World on Fashion, Fisherman, and the Sardine Dress was published by Counterpoint Press in 2021. Among her most keen interests is the intersection of art and science. Her work has been awarded the Pablo Neruda Prize from Nimrod, Pushkar Prize, the Gertrude B. Clater Award from the Poetry Society of America, and the Bayer Award in Science Writing from Creative Nonfiction for the essay, Poetry and Science, A View from the Divide. She's a dedicated teacher and has served on the faculty of many places, including the Prague Summer Program, the Taos Summer Writers Conference, the Kachemak Bay Writers Conference here in Alaska, in Homer. Um, and you can still sign up for, for this year's uh, conference, fabulous lineup coming up at the end of May. Uh, the University of Montana's Environmental Writing Institute and uh, the Breadloaf Orion Environmental Writing Workshop, among many, as I said. And her writing has been widely published and anthologized and is perfect for today since she's been everywhere from Scientific American to American Poetry Review. Alison Deming, who says, the arts have been with human culture for at least 30,000 years as a means for us to handle complexity and uncertainty and the beautiful mystery of our inwardness. Data is not the answer. Rethinking ourselves and how we behave toward one another and toward the mothering planet is what counts now. Her advice is for artists and scientists to spend time together in one place, sharing conversations and questioning each other. And as she says, we, we meet first as people with a shared love of amazing life. And then the conversations around a campfire may be much more useful than the one around the conference table. And Corey's debut novel, Lost Mountain, was just published with West Margin Press. She is also the author of three poetry collections, Bone Strings, A Measure's Hush, Violet Transparent, and the co-editor of Cross Currents North, uh, a collection of Alaskans uh, writing about the environment. Her work has appeared in the Southern Review, Northwest Review, Poetry, North American Review, in addition to, of course, Alaska Quarterly Review. She's uh, the recipient of fellowships from the Alaska State Council on the Arts and the Rasmussen Foundation here in Alaska. And she divides her time between Homer and uh, her birthplace on remote Lake Clark in Southwest Alaska. Anne Carre has lived most of her life far away from towns and cities off the road system in, in very rural Alaska with, as she says, only a super cub and an 18 foot open skiff for transportation. And she notes that, and, and I would have to agree with this, that the Alaskan landscape is her identity. Anne Carey, who says, even though readers may never be able to visit me in person, I find great pleasure in the thought that I can invite people from anywhere in the world to share something of my Alaskan experiences, as well as my imagined creations. She goes on to say that the bounty of wild fish and game is something she's willing to fight for. I feel so fortunate, Carey notes, to live in a time when these treasures remain largely unspoiled. But when that landscape and lifestyle are threatened, she finds she can no longer remain silent. And she says, my protest comes out in the form of the written word. And yes, all of her poems were first written by hand. Ellen Bass is one of my heroes, and so it's great to be with her today. And Ellen is the author of seven poetry collections. Uh, Bruce Pang, who is the former Portland uh, Poet Laureate, notes that she is one of our major poets and for a good reason, not just because she's a deft craftsman, but because she's real. And that is not something easy to come by these days. And actually she's in good company. The other two women who are with her today, the same could be said of them. Her most recent collection is Indigo, published in 2020. With Florence Howe, she co-edited the first major anthology of women's poetry titled No More Masks, but that was back in 1973. <laughs> uh, speaking of different masks. And uh, she also co-wrote uh, the groundbreaking uh, book, The Courage to Heal, a guide for women survivors of child sexual abuse. Uh, among her awards are fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the California Arts Council, three Pushcart Prizes, the Lambda Literary Award. Uh, she's a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets and founded poetry workshops at Salina Valley, uh, Salinas Valley State Prison 
and Santa Cruz uh, in, in jails and uh, teaches in the MFA writing program at Pacific University. She grew up in New Jersey and earned an MA in creative writing from Boston University where she studied with Anne Sexton. Ellen Bass, who says, I work to speak in a voice that is meaningful communication. Poetry is the most intimate of all writing. I want to speak from me to myself and then from me to you. Her collections include Meals of Love, The Human Line, and Like a Beggar. Ellen, it is such a pleasure to have you here and to meet you. Take it away. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with all of you. This is just uh, Allison and Anne. Thank you so much for uh, doing this together. And thank you, Heather, for that beautiful introduction. And Ron, for all your work with Alaska Quarterly, which is such an important publication and one that has meant a lot to me uh, over the years and to so many readers and writers. And um, I'm going to start with a poem of mine that was published in the Alaska Quarterly. Oh, I should say I am in Santa Cruz, California, and uh, this is the land of the Awaswas people, also known as the Santa Cruz people, a tribe of the Ohlone nation and um, it's a, a beautiful day here with a little rain which we're so grateful for every tiny bit of rain is just a blessing these days in Santa Cruz. This poem that was published uh, many years back in the Alaska Quarterly has nothing to do with Earth Day so I'm going to start with it and we'll just kind of um, then move on to earthier things but I just wanted to acknowledge the Alaska Quarterly in this way. It's called Why People Murder. I found out why people murder in the kitchen of our house in Boulder Creek, where we've made soybean patties, dozens of soybean patties, ground up in our Vitamix blender and stacked in saran wrap in the freezer. He was in the living room in navy blue sweatpants and sheepskin slippers and his pipe. He was tamping tobacco with his thumb and looking for matches. I picked up the knife we'd used to chop onions, onions and carrots, and whatever else it was we put in those hopeful dry little cakes. The details of this particular fight are lost, but trust me, they don't matter. Just imagine need, primitive, a baby screaming for the tit, lust, the clawing into another, wanting to part the other like water and be taken in, and desperation, that's the big one. You're shaky as a junkie, the pain hums an electric current. You're frozen to it, a dog who's gnawed on a cord and must be kicked off. Save me, I'm frantic, I'm on my knees prostrate, I'm flat as wax across the linoleum floor. The knife is clean, I washed it after the onions. I lurch into the living room. My breath comes out visible like in cold weather. When he sees me, he's startled, doesn't know if he should be scared. I'm emanating like a rod of uranium. He says my name, tentative. I look down at the knife as if I were carrying it to the drawer and took a wrong turn. This next poem is called Ode to the First Peach, and I, am, uh, I, I owe it to my wife who thinks I don't go outside enough and a couple of years back brought me into my office, the, the first peach from our peach tree and said, here, <laughs> write about this. Ode to the First Peach. Only one insect has feasted here a clear stub of resin plugs the scar, and the hollow where the stem was severed shines with juice, the fur still silvered like a call. Even in the next minute, the hairs will darken, turn more golden in my palm, heavier this flesh than you would imagine, like the sudden weight of a newborn. Oh, what a marriage of citron and blush, it could be a planet reflected through a hall of mirrors, or what a swan becomes 
when a fairy shoots it from the sky at dawn. At the beginning of the world, when the first dense pith was ravished and the stars were not yet lustrous coins fallen from the pockets of night, who could have dreamed this would be carried from the chaos? Scent of morning and sugar, bruise and hunger, silent, swollen, clefted life, remnant always remaking itself out of that first flaming ripeness. This next poem um, is called The Big Picture and uh, it was included in an anthology that I wanna tell you about if you're not familiar with it. It's called All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis, which is just a terrific anthology. If you feel despair, if you feel like, oh my God, you know, every time I think about the trouble we're in, I just am miserable and don't know how to cope with it. This book is so positive and really energizing and really reminds us that uh, all is not lost. Yes, it's, a, I mean, we know how bad it is. I don't need to tell you, but all is not lost and there's so many things we can do. And I was, I was really happy to have my poem included and I just recommend this book really highly, All We Can Save, The Big Picture. I try to look at the big picture, the sun, ardent tongue, licking us like a mother besotted with her new cub will wear itself out. Everything is transitory. Think of the meteor that annihilated the dinosaurs and before that, the volcanoes of the Permian period all those burnt ferns and reptiles, sharks and bony fish. That was extinction on a scale that makes our losses look like a bad day at the slots. And perhaps we're slated to ascend to some kind of intelligence that doesn't need bodies or clean water or even air. But I can't shake my longing for the last 600 Iberian lynx with their tufted ears. Brazilian guitar fish, the 4% of them still cruising the seafloor, eyes staring straight up. And all the newborn marsupials, red kangaroos, joeys the size of honeybees, steelhead trout, river dolphins, so many species of frogs breathing through their damp permeable membranes. Today on the bus, a woman in a sweater the exact shade of cardinals and her cardinal colored bra strap exposed on her pale shoulder makes me ache for those bright flashes in the snow. And polar bears, the cream and amber of their fur, the long hollow hairs through which sun slips swallowed into their dark skin. When I get home, my son has a headache and though he's almost grown, asks me to sing him a song. We lie together on the lumpy couch and I warble out the old show tunes, night and day, they can't take that away from me. A cheap silver chain shimmers across his throat, rising and falling with his pulse. There never was anything else, only these excruciatingly insignificant creatures we love. I had the good fortune to um, spend a week at the Andrews Experimental Forest in Southern Oregon. Some of you know of it, and it's a brilliant place in every way with, you know, trees that are hundreds and hundreds of years old and going hundreds and hundreds of feet up into the sky, old growth conifers. And they are uh, the, the people who, created the Andrews and uh, continue with it, have the brilliant idea of connecting artists with scientists and see that a conversation between us all is a good idea, which is uh, 
so obvious, but not always, uh, not always obvious to everyone. But uh, they have these wonderful residencies, and I loved my week there. And I wrote this poem. It's called "Fungus on Fallen Alder at Lookout Creek." Florid, fluted, flowery petal, flounce of a girl's dress, ruffled fan, striped in what seems to my simple eye an excess of extravagance. Intricately ribboned like a secret code, a colorist's vision of DNA. At the outermost edge, a scallop of ivory, then a tweedy russet, then mouse gray, a crescent of celadon velvet, a streak of sleek seal brown, a dark arc of copper, then butter, then celadon again, again butter, again copper, and on into the center, striped thinner and thinner to the green, green moss furry heart. How can this be necessary? Yet it grows and is making more of itself, dozens and dozens of tiny starts, Stars no bigger than a baby's thumbnail, all of them sucking one young dead tree on a gravel bank that will be washed away in the next flooding winter. But isn't the air here cool and wet and almost unbearably sweet? I have um, a couple of new poems that I'd like to read. This one I wrote after spending some time in Yellowstone recently, and uh, it's called Wild. I never saw the wolf, but I saw the antelope running, tan blurs rippling down the hill. In the Lamar Valley, willies and willows and aspen drenched in the gold and cadmium yellow of autumn. I joined the crowd on the side of the road, tripods balanced on the roofs of vans, scopes and binos articulating every flicker of blade and leaf, shimmer of fur. And I thought, okay, maybe this is what we get, like with God or wind or the force that through the green fuse drives the flower, evidence still wild in the remnants of the planet. The wolf is there. And um, this one I wrote uh, sometime after being there, after uh, hearing about this situation that I always hate when people tell you what the poem's about before they read the poem and then you really don't need to hear the poem. So I was just about to go and do that and I'm just gonna stop myself. It's called Fracture. When the grizzly cubs were caught, collared and taken away, relocated they call it, their mother ran back and forth on the road screaming to them, for them. Brutal sound, torn from her lungs. They don't write about this in the news. Her heart, twisted knot, hot blood rivering to the 26 pounding bones of her feet. Just weeks before, I watched a bear and her cub run down a mountain in the twilight. So buoyant, they seemed to be tumbling to the meadow, to the yarrow root they dug, rocking to rest it from the hard ground, fattening for winter. They were breathing what looked like gladness. But that other mother, who will think about her? Her massive head raised, desperate to catch their scent. Each footfall of her dreadful weight, a fracture in the earth's crust. And I'll end with this poem. It's called Still Life. It won't last, of course. The sun at just this angle on the coral tulips. Even now they're spinning away. But oh, these open mouths reach out on their supple stems, revealing yellow throats, golden pistol, and black anthers wheeling. 
They ride the air, loose cups of emptiness, satin feathers, parrot-colored curtains. They billow, they plume, dreamy sails, slack bells. They lift and tremble at the slightest shift. Even my breath sets them nodding. For a minute, maybe two, they dwell and crest. Then the planet's stream takes them with it and the shallow pond of light is gone, except the tip of one petal still catching the sun. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. That was fabulous. Um, and uh, Anne, a, a fellow Alaskan, uh, it's great to see you here, is uh, up next. Am I, can you hear me? Yep, you're ready to go. Hi, my husband just passed me a note and he says, Sean from the poetry box said she has 30 people wanting to get in but can't through AQR. I don't <laughs> know what we should do about that. I don't either, but maybe Ron or Cody does. Uh, yeah, we need, we need to continue with, okay. with the program. Cody's having trouble um, getting the link onto YouTube. Something went wrong in the feed. Uh, and he's saying he's being blocked. We're trying to get folks to link. Um, we, need to, we need to continue so that we can, it's being recorded and it'll go up afterwards. But anyway, this is a serious problem that is not identified. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties that some of you might be experiencing, um, but nevertheless, um, happy Earth Day, everyone. And um, I wanna thank Ron um, with AQR for inviting me to this very, very important event. And thanks as well to the folks at the Anchorage Museum for making it possible. Um, and it's so wonderful to be reading with Ellen and Allison today. A while back, I had a Zoom event with 49 writers and I talked about environmental writing. I mentioned that I distinguish between uh, eco-literature and nature writing, and uh, which I still do. But I also said that some of my best poems are poems of invective. Um, and I wanna retract that now <laughs> because in part, because um, I've been revisiting some of my earlier work and um, I think it was unfair of me to disparage what might be called some of the soft, softer touch pieces. Um, so some of these first ones do fall more into the nature category, but generally speaking, there's been a progression for me toward work that focuses more on environmental issues. It's not always a straight line, but for this reading, I thought I'd start with a few more celebratory poems and then work my way up into the harder hitting pieces. This is very short. It's called The Art of Being. The fern and the rain breathes the silver message. Stay, fly low, play your dark reeds and relearn the beauty of absorption. There is nothing beyond the rotten log covered with leaves and needles. Forget the light emerging with its golden wick. Raise your face to the water-laden frond. A thousand blossoms will fall into your arms. So this next one is called um, One March Animal's Desire. Um, it's from my first book. And there's a play here on the word March, as in a way of walking and also the month. Warm days, we punch the snow with our footsteps, leaving the night's cool mercury to harden a crust. Better to travel early before the sun sends down the weight of its heat. If we were otters, so light and slick, surface wouldn't matter. We'd slide equally happy over white wall, ice or burn. Slung so low, we would not long for a pelvic fault conceive ourselves the surrogates of a god. Heads up, one arm wrapped around heaven, the other aping the ground, we're treadfuls of evolution. 
it's not that great, this awkward posture that lumbers, drills, and pops. Texture, some claim, but I'd as soon leave a glaze or gentle indentation. I want to pass through smoothly, no belt at the hip, no buckle, one tawny hair in my wake where my belly runnels the snow, or a slender whisker dropped in woods as I make my way to the river. In the past, I've expressed uh, a yearning to withdraw from human cacophony to seek quiet and find solace in the natural world. And I suppose that's why my second book is titled um, A Measure's Hush. Here's another poem from that collection. Um, it's very much a research poem. Most of these grasses are not native to Alaska. Grass studies. If we can't be ether, I thought we might settle for grass. And why not slender wheat, which serves as forage for wildlife? Less populous than blue joint. It wasn't grown in Europe like canary, or as seed for captive songbirds, or used the way the Chippewa used foxtail to kill their troublesome dogs. A knife to the throat is considerably swifter. But who among us can know her purpose? It's just the sound of slender wheat I like, although oat grass isn't bad, or Timothy, or Northern Brome, not to be confused with another variety that's smooth and habitat invasive. It's hard to know what's natural, hard to learn that the grain of slender wheat is sometimes infected with ergot, a fungus causing lameness or necrosis. Still, the field is beautiful. There are grasses taller than my head. I'm drawn to the delicacy of inflorescence, the bend of the on in wind. Um, this next piece is, is uh, also from my first book, Bone Strings, and it was written long before the 2016 election, but it seems more relevant today uh, with the reference to demagogues. I'd say the designation nature poem gets uh, somewhat clouded here. It's called Ericleum lanatum, which is the uh, Latin name for cow parsnip. And, these plants get very tall, some uh, up to eight feet, and they have large white flower heads, um, and they grow all over South Central and Southwest Alaska. Ericleum lanatum. The flowers seem whiter this summer, more delicate than I remember. Drops of ethereal blood, the umbels and onion skin tracing set down with a fine tipped pen. What else might I miss in this life? How many days have I not seen the sky? Soft rags of clouds shining up the blue, their shadows tumbling casually over the mountains, while disillusion, like a dark flame, burned my mind's petty length. I'm tired of human clamor, smudge and clutter of the world. Who wants to go on governed by the same rude horns, the demagogues, the rabble? Let the culture fall to its own cravings. I'm taking up with things divine, leaf filter, sheath, and fiber, stocks so tall they often lean, but determined to grow taller, that ask for only the rain's thin coins, the soil's nutrient, and a decent light. Moving forward, um, I have a slew of animal death poems, and I'm not going to read them all, but I'll just give you some titles. Elegy for Four Wolves, Killed by a Neighbor Last December. Martha, about the last known uh, living passenger pigeon. Dirge, about a moose cat that drowned when our dog chased it into the water and my feelings of guilt. Uh, and Window Feather, about a junco that hit my window. I want to read this next one, not only because it was published in a QR, but because it represents how reading has taken me to other places. This poem was born after I read the nonfiction book In the Heart of the Sea by Nathaniel Philbrick about the Nantucket whalers. Eulogy for the Galapagos tortoise. 
Like Hector, their armor did them no good, though they weren't speared, merely flipped by whalers, then pinned with a rock, not dragged by chariot around a tomb. Their legs were thonged, their 80 pound bodies strapped to a human back. The man must have cursed that weight in the sweltering heat as they struggled to the ship, but revenge was not a motive. The worth of a tortoise, 4,500 calories per man, equivalent to nine days hardtack. Old pacifists of the slow blink, they say you could live for up to a year without any food or water. I see you on the battlefield, the open deck, bracing each roll of waves with your monumental legs, swinging in bewilderment your penile heads. Surely you would have given up on the tucked appendage and the dome that was not quite heaven. You must have understood at last that only the vulnerable come close to becoming immortal. Um, this next one is set in Alaska, but on the Aleutian Islands, which I've never visited. It's titled The Sea Cow, and I wrote it after reading an account of the tragic Bering expedition where the sea breaks its back by Corey Ford. Uh, the sea cow was a large manatee looking creature that was hunted to extinction. Her heavy body heaved away from shore, a sprout of blood on her back where the last gash furrowed. A plague of knives and bayonets, pennons of loosened skin rippled in clear May air. The fluked anchor gouged her side. Men on beach and boat held firm. She weakened. Her mate clubbed and jabbed, swam in as far as the shallows. Food for a fortnight, wrote the lieutenant. Seven months the shipwrecked crew had fought, scurvy, foxes, weather, and starvation. Forty would survive, not bearing. He died December 8, half buried already in sand. Discredited, scorned, he'd given 10 years to the crown, an ever listing ship of duties. He was tired, he cared no more for honor. Briefly, he'd seen his men loosen their insolent lines of rank to tend one another as friends. At the edge of his dreams, the sea cow nibbled the tender kelp quietly as if kindness could be a way of life. Um, I wanted to read another piece called From the Testimony of Rivers um, because the speaker, we, is the collective voice of rivers, but I don't have time for it. So I'm gonna move on to the climate change poems. Um, again, I have a lot of them, but I wanted to share two that just appeared in AQR. Um, these are part of a 24 poem linked sonnet sequence that it will be published this summer as a chat book titled Late Fall Bucolics, which is meant ironically. This is called Gullible Hope. Uh, I stole the phrase from Plato and it was great fun to research how various cult cultures have perceived hope. And um, I was really happy to throw in Greta Thunberg's comments about it here. Little heads up, Elpis was the spirit of hope in Greek mythology and uh, Vaughn was the North Norse name for hope. Gullible hope. Gullible hope has managed to endure since Pandora first trapped the spirit in her jar while evil outside a firefly so kept is sure to die, and with our current climatic war, even the ancient Greeks would have marveled at her survival. Though whether Elpis was deemed a gift or curse was long debated. For the grizzled Norseman, Vaughn was poorly rated, slobber that streamed from the jaws of Fenris Wolf, verse less than suitable for the Bible. While Greta, our solemn Swedish maiden, is partial to panic. I don't want you to be hopeful, she declares. She flips back her braids and urges action. I look to the sky, no moon tonight, and I've lost her last position. She'll wax again and wane before Earth's holocaust. 
Uh, and then the, the follow up poem to this, because these are linked sonnets. Um, this this one is uh, called Holos, and it begins with an etym etymological exploration of the world, the word Holocaust. Holos, whole with Kaustos burnt is Holocaust, for ancients sacrificed by fire burnt offerings. Moderns present them via car and ship exhaust, toxic gases, particles that clog the lungs. Oh, earthlings, forever giving, no mere bowl, but a heaven full of benefactions. Imagine what's up there, fumes of goat, sheep, bullock, pigeon and turtle dove, all the heated breath that's fashioned into prayer, not to mention smoke from the Amazon and Indonesia. There's more, of course, but the list is tedious. God is stifling a wide yawn. Enough. You'd think by now he would insist we curb the burning. We need a sign, monsoon and hurricane, that scald and blister the skin, a blazing wind, a searing rain. Um, and one more. This is um, also from this, um, this sequence. Um, they're all rhyme sonnets, by the way. And this one is very much a place poem. And um, here I punch, point to my own culpability regarding climate change. It's called Wrapped, R-A-P-T. Evening, the welcome dark. We lie on the bed, wrapped by fire, visible through the glass door of our stove. Blame a serpent's tongue, coals hot coral, capped with beetle-killed round, rounds of spruce. The insects love the changing climate, as Steve and I love wood, the texture, the heft the harvest, the sawing and hauling until the split dry log in its smelted coffin is laid to rest. And mostly the warmth, which feels more natural a source than that of a furnace fed with oil. We justify our use, trees are renewable, but too many homes reliant have denuded whole landscapes, engendered injurious air. What choice, we are here our lifestyle we pledge to spare. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Anne. I'm looking forward to this conversation as we move forward now into Allison. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here um, to celebrate Earth Day uh, and to celebrate with these two other amazing poets, Ellen and Anne, thank you for your beautiful work. Uh, I'm also very happy to help celebrate Alaska Quarterly Review, uh, which has done so much for writing and writers for so long and Ron for shepherding that effort for so many years. So thank you so much for inviting me today. Even though my background it does not say so, I am speaking to you from the Sonoran Desert where I live most of the year. And this is uh, Arizona's home to 22 federally recognized tribes. And it's currently the home of the Tohono O'odham and the Yaqui people. And I am very grateful to share the community with uh, their history and their present and their future. Uh, I'm going to read uh, poems, uh, and it's uh, I, I I was shocked to see how long ago these poems appeared in Alaska Quarterly Review. I'm going to have to send you some new work, I think. Um, but these poems were in my 2005 book, Genius Loci, and um, you know, one of my favorite things is to be out in nature with field biologists and to learn from them, and then try to turn their scientific talk, uh, which can be really, well, let's say dull, um, into some kind of a song. So this is a, a walk with some naturalists in uh, the desert Southwest, the naturalists. When the naturalists see a pile of scat, they speed toward it as if a rare orchid bloomed in their path. They pick apart the desiccated turds, retrieving a coarse black javelina hair or husk of pinion nut as if unearthing gems. 
They get down on their knees to nose into flowers, a micron wide, belly flowers, they say, because that's what you get down on to see them. Biscuit root, buffalo gourd, cryptogams, to them are hints of some genetic memory fossilized in their brains and ancient music they try to recall because although they can't quite hear the tune, they know if they could sing it, that even their own wild rage and lust and death terrors would seem as beautiful as the endolithic algae that releases nitrogen into rocks so that junipers can milk them. I, the forest behind me is in the Canadian Maritimes where I've spent um, summers since I was a young child. And um, this also was in um, uh, Alaska Quarterly. And, you know, I, I love picking wild fruit up there. And I, I think probably the wild fruit, the wild berry season is really close to Alaska's, although we don't have salmon berries. And this is a sequence of poems. I'm just gonna read the first two, but it kind of goes through the whole season of the wild berries from the strawberries to the raspberries, to the blueberries and the gooseberries and, and blackberries. Um, I'll just read the first two. Well, the sequence opens with a quotation from Paul, 1 Corinthians, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. One, at the cusp when spring begins to turn into summer, come the strawberries, little baby's knuckles lying low in the scrub so that one who would taste their juice must kneel or lie on the ground, testing her gentleness. The season is short, yet if she grows impatient, she will carry home only the blood soaked into the jeans, soaked into the knees of her jeans. They are so precious that a woman might refuse to eat them. Five years worth in jars, untouched on the shelf, but she would grow bitter from trying to hold on to that which will pass. Two, if you want wild raspberries, level an acre of forest and leave the lot a mess of bleaching brush. The brambles will crawl out of the rubble as if to compensate the land for its grievous loss. To pick the berries, you must walk knee deep in deadfalls, waist high in thorns and compete with yellow jackets. You must inch your way into thickets, crushing a path through the canes, throwing off the green beetle and white spider that rise in your bucket like stones in a farmer's field. And when you are done, backtracking through your own destruction. You will step free of the uncertain ground and walk happily, perhaps through a meadow of ferns to come home, lay ice on the bee stings and savor in small handfuls, the healing taste of the wild. Um, uh, may you all have many berries this summer, wherever you are. So I'm going to read a few poems now from uh, a new manuscript, uh, which is called The, Ex the Excavations, which I've just finished. Um, and um, uh, again, I will be by regional, but the first one is set uh, in the Southwest. I went up to hike in the Sedona regions, beautiful red rock country, and um, there was such wildfire there that one couldn't get into any trail. Everything was closed. It was perilous. National Forest. Bell Rock, Courthouse Rock, Devil's Bridge. Time has made the landforms and they grow more beautiful with age. Names come from the human world. Possession bleeding into perception. What if the land had its own language? No alphabet, but steady drone of grasslands, groan of mountains, 
drought fires scream, a drawn out cry, hiss of rain, simmer of seeds stirring restless in the soil, pure presence and process breaking into the place made new by cataclysm. That's the planet speaking. And she cares about the fissures in the dry riverbed about the lack of ripe cherries in Washington and blue crabs in Maryland, savanna lions down by half. She cares about the sunrise, dandelions, the PCBs. She embraces whatever we give her, blood, bone, rust, become her. She invented us to do the work the word care implies, invented us to invent words the thicket of endless possibilities, so death does not get the last word, so groan and hiss could be accompanied by our chatter, dirge, thesis, and psalm. If you hear some strange noises, I have a puppy who is breathing heavily beside me because she loves uh, poetry reading. So um, please welcome her and I hope she won't be too distracting. She has a limited um, period of time for which she likes poetry, but hopefully she will continue for a bit longer for us. Um, this is another poem from this manuscript. And this is uh, this was a poem that was in Scientific American. It was such a thrill and honor to be in, in that magazine. And um, this poem set in New Hampshire where I was teaching at the uh, Environmental Literature Institute, which is a wonderful program for um, largely for high school teachers. And we went out and had a field experience and, and this poem came out of that. Letter to 2050. The Squamscott River grew lazy in early summer. Muskrat rose and doe, heron swept the air and landed, and hemlocks that had survived another century's practice of harvesting their bark were thriving. Some suffered from beaver girdles and the predation of woolly edelgids, but still, the palliated woodpeckers found what they required in the snags. This is how it was for us, pulling threads of hope out of the air as if we had the skill to weave them back into webs. We surprised ourselves when it worked, so much needed to be undone. But I promise you, as paltry as our efforts may seem to you, no, I won't justify our failures. The story of the alewives return, that's what I wanted you to know, because it helps to think of desires that last for centuries without being satisfied. How far inland did the alewives come, I wondered. The dam removed after 300 years, and in the first year then, they came in a rush. Locals could hear the gulls gathered in the estuary in their joy and the alewives swam and swam to the reaches of their ancestors. 11 miles and 300 years of appetite for place, their genes remembered and knew how to find. The Abenaki offered a welcome back ceremony and fishers gathered, human, cat, and bird to feast. And the memory that had been thwarted for centuries became a fertile flow. So um, I've been really fortunate when I'm up in the Bay of Fundy to uh, go out to a research site on a little tiny island, it's about a mile long, Kent Island, where Bowdoin, Re Bowdoin College has been doing scientific research, um, I think since the 40s, 30s or 40s. And oh, there's a bird I've come to know there. Uh, it may be important for you to know that the, the Gulf of Maine and the Bay of Fundy, the North Atlantic, the um, Western part of the North Atlantic, um, is heating up four times faster than um, the oceans anywhere else. And it's largely because of the double factor of a, a hotter Gulf Stream coming up and then the melt coming down from the glaciers of Greenland. So uh, everything is in a very um, tenuous state. 
But one of the species that's been studied there um, for a, a very long time, since the mid 50s, is this marvelous pelagic bird, the leech's storm petrel. It lives at sea all year, but when, it, when it, it's time to nest, it, it, has, it digs a burrow in forests like the one behind me. And uh, I'm, I'm absolutely in love with this bird and with the scientists who've been studying these birds on Kent Island since the 1950s. It's one of, probably one of the longest single site, single species studies of any bird anywhere. So I've got a whole series of poems called Field Studies. I, I think I'll have time to read you um, three of these poems. Navigation of the leech's storm petrel. Science wanted to know what they know. Sooty little tube-nosed ocean runner, fork-tailed forest burrower, night wanderer, transient in the sweet musk of woods. How do they find their way? What's their sense of place? Do they, know, do they know a sense of belonging when they return from a year at sea to breed in the forest where they hatched? Or is it just work to repair the burrow? They stagger around at night on forest paths. They don't understand the land, but they need it. A man who studied the colony for half a century took a few petrels to Ireland to see if they could find the way back. First bird got back before the man. Was it nine days or 13? Do the numbers matter when the bird just knew its inner compass reading longitude and latitude skirting open ocean swells to arrive exactly where it knew it should be? Sight fidelity of the leeches storm petrel. At night, the pairs chuckle and purr, sometimes in harmony, nestled in their burrows, ghosting the forest with their chatter. They have a lot to say after spending so long in solitary flight with nothing on their minds but light and wind and the scent of prey that draws them onward. They might fly 400 kilometers from land, seeking lanternfish and krill, loading oil to bring home for the chick. They winter at sea, intimate only with water, until some brain or body switch flips. Who can explain the call for another? The call for home. Together again, same time, same place next year, more faithful to burrow than to spouse, grooming the nest with soft leaves, fresh grass. They talk and talk throughout the night. And um, I'll end with this one, petrol chick. What did I know, lying in the darkness where I had hatched? At first, I loved the smell of loam, musk, the dampness of the underneath. Then came a fishy scent, though what did I know of fish? Bill to bill, my lunch was served. I had no control over where I lived, when or what I ate. But sufficient to my status as a puff of proto feathers, the meals kept tunneling down from the spot of light at Burroughs End. I knew to raise my mouth to what arrived. I had no idea what I was or what I was meant to be. Ridiculous, I know that I should have a voice. Sleep and eat and roll over in the earthen dark. That was life. Until I grew, I grew so blubbered, I could barely turn in my sleep. I squeezed out of that earth hold when I caught the open ocean scent that told me I had wings and I was gone into sea spangled spume and sky. Oh man, that was fabulous, Allison. Thank you for, uh, for being our cleanup hitter here. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and um, now uh, I guess you three are going to take it away and have a little conversation about uh, what it all means. Well, I, I think I was kind of, uh, Ron kind of designated me as, as the opening act here. Um, so I, I mentioned briefly uh, to you uh, earlier, and I, I'm going to repeat that, that I 
I actually attended the AWP conference um, in Philadelphia. It's only my third conference ever. And um, my uh, the publisher of my first book, Lucy Lang Day, um, was, you know, she wanted to do a, a poetry of place reading and she invited me and and she really urged me it's okay go ahead you can fly and blah 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 you know because it is still an issue uh, so i went and um and I, I admit that in the past i haven't always felt like you know <laughs> it was worth the um the cost of airfare and whatnot but but this time i really did um i got to meet some some um kindred spirits. And, um, and it was so refreshing to know that there are other people out there doing this kind of work. And so, you know, you feel you feel less alone. Um, and I also want to mention that I, I did have one uh, poem in an anthology recently that was titled Rewilding. It was published by um, Split Rock Press, Crystal Gibbons. And um, I was really amazed to see how many poets now are writing eco poetry. Um, I think the genre has just blossomed in the last 20 years. Um, so I, I guess, you know, just as, a, as an opener, um, you know, have, have, have you, Allison and Ellen, noticed um, a surge like that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I started out, I felt a little weird because everybody was, well, my, my friend Gary Paul Naphan always said that, well, everything is nature writing except what's urban dysfunctional writing. And, but, you know, everything was urban dysfunctional writing. And um, I, I felt a little strange and, and like, well, what's the matter with her? She doesn't write about people, you know, I, and I, um, I, I didn't, I didn't, want to deal with this feeling of human exceptionalism that all that mattered to me was human beings and our problems. And I've always had that feeling, which was odd when I started out in the 80s and 90s. But now, yes, I think you're absolutely right, Anne. And I think climate change and this awareness that we're living in the Anthropocene, it's just firing up people's grief, people's wish to speak of loss, to find ways to come together, to invite all these other species as you both did into our poems. I mean, I, I think it's a very exciting time for eco-poetry and eco-poetics. And, and I'm, um, I just couldn't be more thrilled to see uh, what's happening now. Yes, I, I agree completely with what both of you are saying. I think that we that that even those of us who might not may not have been attuned to this um, are are now you can't help but be it's it's just impossible if you're a, a person who's paying any attention at all and you're a writer and when you sit down to write you try to in some way uh, access what is uh, real and uh, and pay attention to it so I think that that even poets who don't maybe define themselves as eco poets, that it's all coming into all of our poetry. It just can't stay out at this point. Yeah. So, so one, um, I, I, I've given a couple of talks um, about, um, you know, eco writing, and I, I love to go back in time and, and look at, you know, people that were doing things, um, you know, well before the genre, you know, was supposedly born. And um, one, one poem that I love to point to is um, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, mm -hmm. uh, and Woodsworth, because, you know, I, I don't know if you remember the poem well, but, um, you know, uh, the, the mariner shot the albatross basically because he could, even though the bird had helped the sailors through this horrific, you know, experience. And so then he, he alone survived to tell the tale. And then he goes and, you know, he goes to the church and he accosts these people on the way to their, this wedding and, um, and tells about this because this is this is his burden. This is the albatross that he's wearing around his neck. Mm -hmm. But I, I just so I've, I've been doing a lot of research, you know, trying to go back in time and, and see, you know, who the precursors were. And um, I wonder if any of you have. Um, I know it's kind of hard to come up with uh, <laughs> with poems or or um, you know or 
writers just off the top of your head, but maybe someone springs to mind as being, you know, mm -hmm. some. Well, this, this doesn't go back as far as the ancient mariner, which I just love you making that connection. I think that's really mm -hmm. great. But um, I, I go back a lot to Susan Griffin in the 70s and her incredibly important book, Woman in Nature, which I don't think people uh, who, you know, weren't adults at that time, uh, you know, younger people I don't think know about, but it's an extraordinary book mm -hmm. in, in which she um, goes through the things that have been said through the centuries about women and the things that have been said about animals and nature mm -hmm. and trees. And um, it, it's, I, I you know, I, I don't know if you can even buy it new anymore, you know, but it's, it's a, probably you can, maybe there's, you know, new editions, but I was uh, giving a talk on eco poetry recently and read a, a fair amount from that book because she is saying the things she, she allows all the animals to also have their voice. And mm -hmm. um, it's, mm -hmm. it's a devastating book. And at, at that time in the, in the 70s, I think as that wave, that second wave of feminism, women's liberation was coming into being, mm -hmm. there was a lot of um, awareness of uh, that connection between mm -hmm. the way that women were uh, discounted and uh, destroyed uh, and, and nature. Right, right. Uh, somebody has birds tweeting and I'm so I whoever they whoever has invited the birds thanks this is great yes <laughs> um, this wonderful mockingbird who has beautiful. been just marvelous in the past oh, couple of months yeah I love it well uh, yes I'm I'm so happy you you mentioned that and I you know I would mention Elizabeth Bishop you know it was among our more recent um uh, ancestors in poetry because her her wonderful um, poems from Brazil and the book Questions of Travel, the book Crusoe in England. I mean, she uh, she's not spoken of as an eco poet, but that sensibility is there. The power of place, the power of species, the power of the folk tales about species. That's all in Elizabeth Bishop, and and she's one of our great poets. But you know, I, I was really happy that you mentioned the rhyme of the ancient mariner, Anne, and and that takes me back to the romantics, of course. And, and for me, the, the least recognized and celebrated of the romantics who should be is the poet John Clare. And I really recommend people look up John Clare because I, you know, I'm fascinated by the, the fisher people in the Bay of Fundy where I spend the summers because I think people who work in nature know nature really well, almost better than the scientists. And um, they know it differently, at least perhaps, than the scientists. And John Clare um, grew up uh, at the time when it was possible as a, as a, as a peasant or as a person of low means uh, to live very modestly and to work a plot of land. This was before the clearances, the Scottish clearances that kicked all those people off the lands so that the wealthy could occupy the lands. And John Clare is a great poet. Um, his poems you, you can find online. And he also suffered from um, alcoholism and, and some kind of mental illness that today could be helped probably pharmaceutically, but he spent a great deal of his life in institutions of uh, very inhumane nature. But I highly recommend that people look for his bird nest poems because they're absolutely beautiful and they're all the field observation, the specificity of the species, what they use to build their nests with, what their eggs looked like, the fragility of these birds nests lying in an agricultural field where the horses are coming through with the plows. He got it, you know, he got the observational detail, he got the beauty of nature, he got the fragility of nature. And um, I think John Clare, C-L-A-R-E, if you don't know, is somebody to go back to, um, to, to see someone who worked close to the land and, and his spirit, and this is a person whose spirit was troubled, his spirit was deeply fed and I think stabilized, if I could claim that, by his engagement with these vulnerable species. Well, thank you for that because I'm, I'm um, I don't know if 
okay. <laughs> waiting for my little picture to come up here. But anyway, um, yeah, I'm, I'm always looking for, um, you know, I like to go back in history and I like to see, you know, what, who preceded us. Um, and, and I also have to say that um, even though I do distinguish between, you know, environmental uh, or I should say eco poetry and nature poetry. I think there is a, a, a little bit of a separation there. I, I mean, we certainly owe a lot to nature poets, the, you know, uh, the, you know, the English romantics, the, uh, you know, the ancient Chinese poets, you know, if you want to go way back, um, because, you know, if you don't have that, you know, that appreciation, then how can you write about devastation in a way? I mean, you have to start from that place of care and concern. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other place to look is Camille Dungy's amazing anthology called Black Nature. That is a whole history of nature poems by African-American um, writers uh, deeply grounded in the history. It's a really magnificent, huge collection and it helps us to see whoa, we're only looking at the white writers, we're missing a whole lot. So I highly recommend that as well. Yeah, that's that's a great book. That's Isn't that really great, but one poem after it's, it's yeah. a fat book and the yeah. poems are all so good. I know. And that the, uh, I mean, there's so many anthologies now, but the other one that I think is very, very strong is the Eco Poetry Anthology that Ann Fisher Worth and Laura, Laura, is it Gray Street? Yeah. yeah. Um, Yes, absolutely agreed. That that uh, also is just terrific, and um, and the poems are so varied in both of these. I, that's one of the things that I I like about both these anthologies is that you don't read one poem after another that is doing essentially the same thing, even if it's doing it well. They, all the poems are coming from such different perspectives and and. Uh, angles and sensibilities, styles. I just wanted to mention too that, um, you know, I, I personally find that I, I use nonfiction a lot. Um, yeah, I'd like to slip in little bits of history here and there. And so I, I think it's really important for poets to read nonfiction, um, you know, Otherwise, we kind of get tunnel vision, I think. Um, so just those, that's why I wanted to read those two examples, those poems where I, you know, they were, they were directly taken from, um, from, from those works, you know, where the sea breaks its back and um, in the heart of the mm -hmm. So what, what, what are we missing here? <laughs> we're getting close to our time. Is there some wrap up thoughts that, um, you know, we, we want to part with? Well, I think people always come to these sessions feeling a lot of grief and a lot of loss and often a lot of futility. And um, well, maybe, you know, I was really interested in when you mentioned hope and the different cultural readings of what hope might be and, um, I always remember, I mean, maybe we should talk about and, and give our listeners something to think about in terms of those feelings, which can silence us, you know, they can silence us. And, and how do we find our voice so that we can make a contribution? Um, and, and I think that's a really important thing for us to do to, to bring people together, um, to be honest and share those feelings. It was in everybody's works, to, you know, that we heard today. Um, I don't know if uh, you both have something that you'd like to add or something that you'd like to add in about what you were saying about hope and, and the different senses of that that you saw across cultures. Well, I have to say I've, I've become with age um, increasingly pessimistic <laughs> and so, but um, you know, but there is this there's this paradox, you know, like here I am writing about it. I mean, if you're going to write, you know, that is kind of a hopeful act, isn't it? Otherwise you might as well just zip the mouth and, you know. So I think the very act of writing is in some weird way hopeful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if you're writing about how you don't believe in hope. <laughs> Well, I think whenever we're talking to each other, um, that's a, a, a positive step uh, because 
when we it's when we stop talking you know it's when we are completely silenced that then we are really paralyzed and i i do love that the the uh, editors of of all we can save i listened to an interview with them a little while back and um they were asking um, about the interviewer was asking about hope, and she she said, you know, fuck hope. Uh, <laughs> I want action and solutions. Yeah. So I I guess what I would say is that I mean I if I say this I don't completely you know I, I believe both sides of this. I mean we need hope, but I think there's a way in which we also can't. Or for myself, I'll say, I can't think too much about whether things are hopeful. You know, how are they going to turn out? Is it going to be all right? Will the human species survive? You know, if I start getting too much into hope, um, then it, it, I don't really have very much um, power. I don't have very much, you know, ability to just say, okay, what is the next thing that maybe I could do? Right. Uh, so, you know, whether this all turns out well or not, you know, how do we want to live our lives? And, you know, that gets me then grounded in a place where I'm not reliant on something that I, you know, can't predict. And, and, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it's not looking real rosy out there. We all know that. But if I can focus on, you know, what can I do? And of course, not only writing, but, you know, the, the, the large and small things that we can do in our own lives that can feel too small. But of course, if we're all doing them, then they're not too small at all. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many ways that regardless of our circumstances, we can uh, mm -hmm. make small differences that add up. So it's that action and solutions that mm -hmm. I, I really keep focusing on, um, you know, rather than the hope part. Can I bring in the, the late great poet W.S. Merwin here? Because he helped me a lot think about this and he worked so hard for conservation in Hawaii and almost every cause he worked for other than the palm forest he grew, you know, failed. But he, he was speaking to a group of us in Arizona once and, you know, everybody's getting more and more depressed talking about this stuff. And somebody said, well, are you at all hopeful? And he said, um, I am not optimistic but I have hope. And that's a very different thing because I make a decision to be hopeful. And then he gave this great an analogy and I've been telling it ever since he said it. <laughs> so this is from W.S. Merwin. When we're in a lifeboat, it's not the time for our worst behavior. It's the time for our best behavior. And you know, that's, that's a pretty decent motto to pick up what Ellen's saying about agency, you know, so. Well, since you bring up W.S. Merwin, I mean, I have to say one of my very favorite poems of all time, time is, is called The Last One. And he, oh, yes. he uses a tree as a metaphor, you know, for um, human greed. And, um, and but that, uh, that poem is also filled with invective. I mean, it's a oh, yeah. hungry poem. And, but I, I think that reading things like that kind of gave me permission, you know, it's like, it's okay. You can express those feelings. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're about to the end of our time here. Um, any, any last thoughts? I just want to say again, that you, you're both such wonderful readers and you have, you're so, smart and you're such thinkers and um you know it's just it's nice to know my tribe exists <laughs> feels good doesn't it yes. I, I would like to just share um from marcel proust with a line that i think about a great deal and actually you'll always have it taped up somewhere that i am the purpose of the artist is to draw back the veil that leaves us indifferent before the universe mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. I guess I, I just want to say how grateful I am to um, uh, all of you, golly, Ellen and Ann and Allison, um, for helping uh, Alaska Quarterly Review celebrate a National Poetry Month and Earth Day here in Alaska, which is kind of, you know, the place 
to be <laughs> if you want to if, if you want to be living with the earth in such a way and um and also on the on the front of climate change in many many ways um you know we're we're watching it i'm watching it out the window with glaciers receding and different weather than we're used to having and different migrations of uh different times of the year for the the birds and the the wildlife um anyway uh, uh thank you and um and i would like to thank all of you for joining us today and uh, to urge you to please uh support writers like ellen and ann and allison you can take their workshops classes uh better yet buy their books at your local bookstore and uh, subscribe to literary journals like Alaska Quarterly Review. And also, since we're done with the series here for, for this uh, year and from last year, I, I just really wanna thank Cody Carver at the Anchorage um, Museum at Rasmussen Center who, who just produces these programs behind the scene and for Ron for uh, giving me the privilege of getting to be part of this. So thank you. 